So yes, yeah, so I'm Senior Research Paramedic with the Trust. I've been a paramedic for the last 22 years and about 10 years ago I moved into education and then moved across into research where I am now. Um, so I thought I'd focus this evening's talk on restarting more hearts, as it was Restart a Heart Day last week, um, and talk about some of the research that underpins what we do in South Central. So I'm going to talk a bit about the national picture um, and mention the chain of survival, which you may be familiar with, um, the impact of bystander CPR and the public access defibrillators that you've probably seen all over the place. Um, one of our newer developments, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest outcomes registry. Um, and some of the projects that have come from that, such as the identification of high-risk communities um, and the Restart a Heart evaluation that's happening this year. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about the Paramedic 2 study that we've been involved with. So nationally, we know that each year the UK ambulance services attempt to restart the hearts of about 28,000 patients. Um, sadly, the survival rates um, to hospital discharge are quite low, so we're looking at about 8% survival. Around about three quarters of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrests actually happen in the home, and about half of them are actually witnessed. 20% are in a shockable rhythm, so these are the patients whose hearts um, might respond to defibrillation. So about a fifth of um, of these hearts might respond to defibrillation, so that's why there's a lot of emphasis on defibrillation. And then when we're looking at how to maximise the chance of survival, there is this thing called the chain of survival. So it's about the steps that need to be in place to, to, to maximise somebody's chances. So the sooner you can recognise a cardiac arrest and call for help, the better. The sooner CPR can be delivered, the better. And the sooner a defibrillatory shock can be delivered, the better your chance of survival. And then once the um, heart has been restarted, then we need to continue with um, what we call a post-ROSC, so that's um, restoration of spontaneous circulation, so post-restoring of a pulse care. So this is something that's fairly new to us. Um, it's very much more protocolised than things used to be. So all of these things need to be in place. And as an ambulance service, we are looking at the research that underpins all of these steps to try and improve our care. So I mentioned the importance of bystander CPR. Um, there's some really interesting research that's been published recently that really sort of highlights the importance of the bystander, the person that's actually there when the event happens. And this was um, some research that happened in Australia, but over quite a long period of time. And you'll be glad to hear that over that 18-year period, the proportion of patients that were receiving bystander CPR has increased. So um, that's really good news. Um, and if we put, put that in the context of survival, you'll see just how good news that is. So looking at the size of these little um, characters, um, if this little blue person represents the number of patients that survive, if the first person to go to their aid is a paramedic, then if you compare numbers of patients that survive, if a first responder gets there first, so even sooner than the ambulance service gets there, they're 1.4 times more likely to survive if a bystander has delivered the interventions before we get there. And if it's even sooner than that, if it's the bystander who's there at the time and delivers the CPR straight away, 2.1 times more likely to survive than if it had been the ambulance service who had arrived first. Now, of course, there's other changes over that 18-year period that have impacted on survival. So there's been a much stronger focus on the quality of CPR that we deliver. Um, and you might be familiar with the uh, British Heart Foundation um, slogan of hard and fast. And that's all evidence-based. You know, it's deeper chest compressions. It's an increased rate of chest compressions that's going to um, give people the best chance of survival. And it's not just about CPR, it's also about getting that defibrillation to the patient as quickly as possible. And you've probably seen defibrillators out in the community in all sorts of locations, uh, maybe on walls or inside um, red phone boxes. Um, and the survival benefit of having public access to defibrillators out there was shown right from the early days, like 2004. If you compare the proportion of survivors 
treated by those that were just delivering CPR with those that also had access to defibrillators, you had a much better chance of survival if those defibrillators are available. But very recently, we've got some really um, interesting research that looks not just at survival, because survival could mean you're back to your normal everyday function, or it could mean you're alive, but you're bedridden and you're unable to do anything for yourself. And, and both of those outcomes would be a successful outcome because it's survival. We're now looking at neurological function, you know, brain function and mobility and how able you are to look after your own affairs. So does public access defibrillation actually impact on good neurological survival? And yes, it does. So for shockable rhythms, so um, when we talk about restarting hearts and defibrillation, I think um, people think of defibrillators as restarting the heart. What they actually do is they remove the electrical chaos um, so they effectively stop that chaos so that the heart can then resume its natural activity. So for the, the shockable rhythms that are likely to respond to defibrillators, if no public access defibrillator is available, you have about 30% survival rates. But if that defibrillator is applied, 70%. It's quite um, a massive increased chance. And notice that it says the pad is applied, not it's actually used. So I'll come back to that. So for the non-shockable rhythm, so this is where you generally you haven't got any electrical activity in the heart. Only about 3% survival if there's no defib. But that's more than doubled if the defibrillator is applied. And again, that's applied and not used because these patients, these patients are in non-shockable rhythm. So the defibrillator will not be treating these patients. But what the defibrillators do, particularly the public access ones, is that they deliver instructions. So they, they talk to you and they tell you to check the patient for signs of life. They tell you to get back on the chest and deliver compressions. And we think that it's, it's this function, as well as actually delivering shocks, that is so important. So then this brings me on to the, um, the OCA registry, so the Out of Hospital Cardiac Arrest Outcome Registry. This uh, was developed um, as a collaboration between University of Warwick, British Heart Foundation, Resource Council UK and all the National Ambulance Services in 2014. And prior to this time, of course, all the ambulance services were gathering data about the outcomes of cardiac arrest, but they were all doing it in isolation. And what this project has enabled is all of the data to be pooled so that we can have a look at, at trends, at variations in outcome. And some of the things that um, this collaboration has achieved since its inception, um, well, the first thing is that we've standardised the way that the data is collected so that we're all measuring the same thing. Then we've started to link data from the ambulance services looking at what actually happens to the patients once they go into hospital and trying to follow right through the patient pathway to try and identify what are the most important treatments along that pathway. There's been a study on attitudes to CPR and what actually makes the difference, what makes somebody deliver CPR or what makes them stand back and think, oh, I'm a bit afraid to actually do that. What they found in that study was it was having training and it, it wasn't about having training recently, it wasn't about having a certain standard of training. It was just that if people had been trained at some point in their lives, it gave them the confidence to then, if they ever needed to use the skills, to actually go ahead and use them. There's been um, involvement in the international partnership of all the, the research councils across Europe um, to try and pull the data across Europe to spot trends there. And other smaller projects have been um, able to apply to the registry to get data to have a look at other sort of sub-studies. So one of the really interesting sub-studies to come out of the registry was looking at the neighbourhood where you have your out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and asking of the data, you know, does it matter where you are when, when this event happens? Um, and yes, it does affect your likelihood of suffering a cardiac arrest, the likelihood of the event being witnessed, the likelihood of receiving bystander CPR and the likelihood of survival. 
So they used the registry database and looked at two and a half years worth of data and looked at the incidents per 100,000 population and whereabouts these events were happening and then looked at the neighbourhoods where they were happening. So in terms of were they urban or rural populations, what was the population density, um, the ethnic mix, was there um, a high degree of long-term health issues or disability, what was the highest level of qualification, um, did the country of birth have an effect, um, and some measures of deprivation, so material deprivation and also socio-economic classification by um, the occupation. So there was clear variability in the instance of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. On the left-hand side, according to where people live, and on the right-hand side, according to the workday population. Um, and as you'd expect, so the darker colours are a higher incidence of arrest. And in um, the areas where people on the right-hand side go to work, so in central London, it's darker there. You'll also notice that the southwest has a much lower incidence of cardiac arrest. And so they started being able to map trends and have a look right down to postcode level at, at what was going on around the country. So they noticed with, um, within the different postcode areas there were trends. So higher incidence of arrest where there was more urbanisation, where there were more people, not surprising, uh, where there was a higher level of deprivation, uh, where there were more people of mixed race or people born outside the UK, um, and unsurprisingly where there was a larger population of older people, um, and also where there was a lower level of qualification and lower level of managerial occupations. So these are kind of similar trends to if you look for um, what factors influence heart disease, for instance, you'll find similar kinds of things with level of deprivation, um, a level of qualification affecting the actual instance of heart disease. So this was really interesting. This was looking at where you're more or less likely to receive bystander CPR. So again, the darker colours, you're more likely to receive bystander CPR in these areas. South Central, I'm happy to say, is quite well served. Um, we've got some fantastic community first responder schemes um, and quite a high level of awareness in the community. But there are areas there where you're a lot less likely to get bystander CPR. So you're more likely to get bystander CPR with the areas predominantly white, where predominantly um, these high level occupations, um, where the population density is lower. And that might feel a bit strange, there's, there's fewer people, so why are you more likely to get bystander CPR? And I think that's something to do with if you live in a rural area where you know you're not likely to get an ambulance quickly, I think the community kind of takes ownership of, of you know, we have to look after each other here, we have to learn how to do CPR. Um, and so you'll, you'll find a lot of community first responder schemes in areas such as this. Overall, the trend is, again, that bystander CPR rates are increasing. So this is really encouraging. And then when you put those two factors together, so the incidence and the bystander CPR, this is where it gets really interesting, actually. And this is where you can identify those high-risk areas. So these are the areas where you're more likely to have a cardiac arrest, but less likely to get the bystander CPR. And this is really interesting for us because it means that we can target training. Um, things like restart heart, we can... Um, target our training in the areas that most need it. There's a lot of areas around the south coast and in the north, um, particularly around Yorkshire. So these are some of the areas that will get a lot of focus on future campaigns. Brings me nicely to World Restart a Heart Day, which you may be familiar with, it was last week. Um, we were out and about all over the place training lots of people. That's my group in the middle there. We managed to train 110 children in one morning. It's quite exhausting, but it was very enjoyable. Um, and it's just fantastic to see. And knowing what we know about the research and what makes people more likely to do CPR is having this training. Seeing all those kids get hands-on practice, we know is going to be so important in their future lives. 
And this year there is a national evaluation of that intervention. So um, Warwick University are doing the study to find out where the events are being held, who attends. So it wasn't just about training school children, it's also going into workplaces. I know that Yorkshire Ambulance Service even had a session down a mine. Um, so who attends, how many people attend, and what do people think of the events, um, and how confident do they feel after leaving the events. And all of this thing, these things can then inform future activities to try and target the training where it is most needed. Now I couldn't really talk about cardiac arrest research in the ambulance services without mentioning Paramedic 2. Um, this is the biggest um, medicines cardiac arrest trial in the world. Um, we were a part of this. Um, adrenaline is, is a standard treatment that's been delivered as part of resuscitation care for 50 years um, without much of an evidence base. And actually what researchers were noticing was that there were trends um, suggesting that it may possibly be harmful. So um, the observational data suggested that whilst it was good at restarting hearts, it might not be good for brains. And so that was why the Paramedic 2 trial came about. And it was a randomised um, placebo-controlled trial of adrenaline and cardiac arrest. So I'm not going to go through all of the background and all of the meth methodology, but I'll just tell you about the results. Um, so when looking at restarting hearts, you're more likely, significantly more likely, to have your heart restarted if adrenaline is used. Significantly more likely to survive to reaching hospital if you've had adrenaline than if you've had placebo. Significantly more likely to be alive at 30 days. But there was no significant difference when looking at brain function, neurological function. But I should say the study wasn't actually powered to detect that neurological outcome. It was just looking at survival to 30 days. So whilst that was a really big and really important study that will probably um, will definitely be taken into consideration with the next guidelines that are released next year, when you look at the um, comparative effectiveness of adrenaline and you think about whereabouts in the chain of survival that comes, so it's way after the identification of the event, it's way after the bystander. If you save one life by using adrenaline, you can save 20 more with getting early defibrillation in, eight times more getting early CPR in, and 10 times more and just making that call early. So as an ambulance service, we are obviously interested in researching every single link of that chain um, and we will continue to be involved in as many studies as we can to try and improve care for these patients.